Alright. Alrighty. So I came up with a bunch of talking points for this um, at the last minute, which shows how um, I can't like hold back my enthusiasm for certain things that I love. Are we recording already? Yes, <laughs> we're recording already. Uh, okay, so we should be like... I'm a Seth or Joshua. This is my sister. Uh, Valerie, also Fari Villar. And today we are talking about Anne Rice and I'm guessing particular subjects, not an overall Anne Rice thing because we are not Anne Rice experts. And we are not. Are Anne, <laughs> and if there are Anne Rice experts listening, go away. Because <laughs> you will be mad at us. I'll be mad at myself. I mean, there was uh, there was a situation where we were talking about the vampire Lestat with a group of your friends, and you mentioned something from the book, and I didn't remember it offhand, and I was still in the middle of reading the book, and I felt so bad. I was like, I don't remember that. And you were like, Josh, it was in the beginning of the book. I'm like, totally lo went out of my head. <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest problem is that we were really big fans and then fell off in the early aughts mm -hmm. and um and i was like i started out being a vampire chronicles fan mm -hmm. and i stayed on being like a really big Anne rice fan because around that time i was like i need more Anne rice i'm gonna read the sleeping beauty chronicles i'm gonna read ramsey's the damned i'm gonna read the Va mayfair witches and then i was like all right i'm good <laughs> well, that, that answers the first question, how we got into it. Like, I got into it through you, and um, I think maybe Pepsi a little bit, because I remember Pepsi was into it as her sister. No, no. Uh, no, okay. Well, I, I do know that I got into it through you and um, a couple of other people. But, um, we had friends. We had friends. You know what? I was, like, the seed of yeah. poison throughout our group because um, I would be really antisocial, and be invited to parties and would sit in the corner and read. And then I'd be teased about it and would read a passage and then people would shut up. Yeah, I mean, for me, like, um, it was one of those things that when I read it, um, I hate to say, I don't want to give her too much credit because she's not the best author in the world, but she made me feel like I was traversing like a different realm and it made me feel like I was like experiencing things new that I've already seen before, which is the very shtick of her her appeal for her books stick. yeah very, very <laughs> and immediately the comment section gets furious with you and and people start sending you hate and and now like people are leaving like <laughs> the chat the moment you say she's not that great um i you know what she had it's that she had a niche at a time where there was there was a need for that filling yeah because there was like bram stoker's and then there were there was like that that gothic period where you know we had um um oh what do you call it um oh it escaped me that they were staying in that house where Mary Shelley and um where there was that like great mythos of, of of Mary Shelley and her husband and they all went to like an island and in a weekend all of these they all like drank a whole bunch of absinthe yeah. and were all inspired to write these great gothic books all at once and it was like a great hoopla cuckoo weekend and they all left and so there was this great period of time was it her, Percy Shelley um, and Frankenstein and oh man all of these uh, it escapes me but you know what period of time like this this beautiful um, like it's it's one of those things that everybody like once once they hear about they're like oh it makes sense mm. this is what you want to hear your legends come out of do you want to hear that this thing was born of of beautificousness that this thing evolved from the ether and it came out of these brain children and 
<laughs> the song that reminds me of Bloodborne, uh, where, where they have all those creatures that are messing with your mind. Well, that's Lovecraftian in, in essence. Yeah. 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 And and the thing is, is after that period of time, there's a great gulf of like wannabes, you know. Yeah, there and was. Then, and then and then you had the the Penny Dreadfuls that filled that gap where it was just like these are great wannabes and these are great like um, short stories of uh, for a penny a piece that they give you this thrill but they're not these masterpieces and as time went on you know it continued this 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 gap of like these one-off experiences Speaking Vampires of became wannabes, and then and then when when Anne Rice came about to it, she was like, "I'm tired of vampires." Being yeah, all the tropes, what, yeah, those horrible what happened, tropes. What happened to vampires being romantic? What happens to vampires being seducers? What happens to vampires being having these these personalities and these passions? Like, stop having them just be the monsters and the shadows that come out each year yeah. and fuck off. Yeah, you know. She, she very much breathed new life into a genre that was declining for a while. I mean, it's declining now again. I'm, I'm hope, that's why I'm having this conversation, because I I'm, I'm was wondering, um, who do you, how do you think they could breathe life back into particularly Anne Rice's genre of, the, of, this, of these stories? Um... I mean, I think that we constantly do in cinema where they mm. try and they try and redo it all the time. Yes. Let's let's just never ever talk about Twilight. Ah. Uh, uh, uh. uh, that however, reminds me of a whole another conversation. But yeah, go on. Yeah. However much of. Uh, uh, I do want to. I do want to also say, like, a, a hell of a amount, like, adoring, adoring, adoring respect to Lon Chaney for playing all of the monsters. Yeah. You know, he did an amazing, incredible job. But they were monsters. Yeah. They were like a redundant amount of monsters. But but they were just monsters, and 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 Anne Rice would just like, well, what if the monsters were they had like passion and they were people? Yeah. Um. But, um, uh, you know, when it came to Twilight, um, it was born of fan fiction, and so it feels, it reads, and it, it performs like fan fiction. She, it was written, um, what if vampires did the thing that we want to wank to? Yeah. And it was horrible. Like, I love the new advertisement where it constantly posts, like, he says this, it's a red flag. He does this, it's a red flag. He says, oh, yeah. shows up yeah. there, it's a red flag. <laughs> and then she's like, kiss me anyway. And they were like, what the fuck? They, yeah, that's, 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 that's just that's weird. That's the last thing I'm going to say about Twilight. I hated that they put that out there, that th these these disgusting relationships and examples of relationships are all positives. And I'm like, none of these are positives. <laughs> this is stalker m mentality. <laughs> Yeah, to get back on to, to Anne Rice, I mean, I think with uh, with Lestat, he starts off in his book going, I'm a monster. Yeah, don't, he admitted it, openly admitted don't, it. Don't, don't cheer for me, don't like me, you shouldn't, you shouldn't love me. Um, I am a romantic beast, I am gorgeous, a beautiful monster. Mm. I will, like, I think the only time he says anything positive is when he talks about his dog. Yeah. <laughs> He's just like, I'm gonna have this dog and take care of this dog. Hey guys, don't worry, I'm not gonna make it into a vampire dog. Oh, but that's it. That's <laughs> I, I did love that part where he kept saying like, I'm not gonna make this into a vampire dog. That was funny. <laughs> he says it in a way like, reader, what are you crazy? <laughs> He's like, I could, in all, for all intents and purposes, I could, but I'm not that kind of cruel. <laughs> hey, you, you, where's your mind going? How dare you go into that direction? But um. <laughs> But he, like, he openly admit, uh, uh, admits, like, uh, I'm gonna manipulate and uh, fuck with Louis. That's yeah. uh, that's that's how I roll. He's um, he is possessive. He yeah. is manipulative. He's selfish. He's cruel. Um, and he 
does it in a way where he is of of the times like he's dated that's another thing that in the world of the vampire chronicles um everybody who is made of their time they're still stuck in their time mm -hmm. and it's not just that they're stuck in the mentality of their time because Lestat was like I want to be a rock star and he became a rock star yeah that was the thing he kept evolving but everybody else around him didn't want to change and then he used yeah. Louis when he was getting out of touch to somehow get back in touch yeah they all made a, a child because they wanted to be in contact with the new era but it was a mistake because then the child would be stuck in that time. I like and you would make a child in 1980 and then that child yeah, would be stuck yeah. in 1980. But like even when he was like, I'm evolved, he was a failure. And he knew that he failed and he was totally 100% in denial about it. I like the way and Anne Rice phrased it that they used these humans to quicken themselves once more. And I, I, that that's always like stuck with me, like the yeah. That that's why they always kept pet humans, which was, I mean, uh, oh God, they made me so mad all the time. The vampires yeah. made me so mad yeah. all the time. I think that's why, and I've said this like uh, to you personally like a hundred times that the book that I loved the most was Queen of the Damned. Yeah, because you saw uh, so many perspectives. Everybody was given their moment to shine and to fail. Uh, everybody was you you were given their their perspectives and you saw their um, their suffering in a way where you didn't have to agree with them but you understood them even, and you mourned their death um, and and you felt that their death was unfair even even if it was just, you know, even if yeah. it was, you, you felt it was unfair, even if it was like understandable, even if you understood, oh, this character has to die or is going to die, it's inevitable that they're going to die. You still felt like, oh man, <laughs> they, they just got here. They were here for a thousand years. I know, but they just like got here. Speaking you of know? which, who is your favorite vampire and why is it our mom? <laughs> okay, here's the question. How okay. many times did you read the Vampire Roman? I only read um, up to a certain portion of it, and they were very. I mean, she's she's she gets. Okay, so why are you a liar? <laughs> Well, I, I I love Armand's depiction from um, Interview the Vampire. Like I loved, the like film? yeah, the film and some of the you book, some of the books. Antonio Banderas. I loved Antonio Banderas. I loved him. <laughs> it was great. So how many times have you seen Desperado? Is what I should really be at. Uh, that's a different conversation altogether. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I think that. Baby Jinx is always the one that yeah, is the thinking. most is the most solid in my mind and she had a chapter she lived she lived she died she existed fiercely and then she perished and and it was so amazing to kind of see the universe in her eyes and, and to empathize um to kind of go like yeah I probably would have gone down that way because there's there's like no way I would have kind of gone along with all of these idiots yeah they want to they want to go on these epic things and I would just want to kind of do my own thing but probably be dragged along and that's what happened to her yeah you know? I just raised your volume a little bit sorry about that no not a problem you do um, you man um uh but i mean but on, at the same time i think i the last one that i read was merrick which literally means i stopped reading at the office because that was her book in 2000. um i think i bought blood and gold I, I actually i own all the rest um but i stopped reading because i have a physical problem holding hardcover yeah which you, you know about but i refuse to buy anything other than hardcovers because i'm a snob um do you think amc can do it justice because we didn't even talk about that amc oh. acquired the rights for okay so here's the thing here's the thing moving back i want to point out that um 
that I also have a fondness for the other vampire story that she did that Vittorio. wasn't Vampire Chronicles. Vittorio. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Pandora, her singular story. Yes. I think Pandora's singular story was, was fucking beautiful. Um, and Vittorio was pretty great. So I think we should kind of singular, single those out because those technically don't fall under Vampire Chronicles. That's... Those fall under... Those actually are listed under the new tales of vampires. You know what's those funny? Don't... Those were included in the list of the movies that AMC acquired. I mean, the rights that AMC acquired. That's interesting. Yeah, that's I the same thing that. I was thinking. I was like, wow, they got Vittorio too? Or at least that's what Mark Bernard said on Fat Man on Batman. Like they got Vittorio also. Hmm. I don't have faith that they will do it justice. <laughs> okay, that's what that's the question I wanted to answer. Um, I mean, after they t- kind of took Walking Dead and then did whatever they wanted without the creator's um, consent, it makes me feel not too secure in um, what they could do with this franchise. I mean, I do like that Brian Fuller was on board, but he dropped out and. Now I don't know who's on board anymore. Okay, okay, okay. Um, my 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 second favorite would probably be pa- Pandora. Um, probably just because of her book, because it was really evocative. That mm. whole scene with exposing their wrists, like there was there was that whole written scene about putting their genitals. Uh, with each other. Oh yeah, I remember that. I remember but that, that wasn't actually sexy. The whole scene about it being evocative and intimate about exposing their wrists was really endearing. It was so much more for me, like uh, just like absolutely more uh, 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 evocative than the whole genitals thing. That was all like, yeah, we put A and B. Mm, that's a thing. I was like, yeah, you, you did, okay. Check that box. Literally. I, I think for me, um, I love Lestat and... What was his friend? Nicholas? Was it Nicholas? The the one that lost his hands? I think so. Or was it Nikki? I, I, either way. Um, yeah, like, that, that was my favorite story arc because that was his best friend that he dragged into it and... I think he got he lost his hands by the co- coven. I don't I don't remember well. Um, either way, he lost his hands and he was constantly cutting off other people's hands to use his hands and stuff like that. Yeah, that's a very vampire thing to do. I yeah. mean, that's a very vampire in like getting back into your roots and being creepy and yeah. stepping away from the romanticism, which I think is really good for her to kind of swing back and forth on that pole. It's the same as like going back to the first books and going, I'm going to make a child vampire to remember to make that child vampire suffer and then kill it. Yeah. You know? you're That's like, yes, there is the romance of these vampires, but hey, uh, look at the needless brutality. And it's like, this b- brutality, not needless, it's called plot. You yeah, know? I mean, for me, like, um, I, I did dig those characters, but there were certain arcs that I don't know if she did them because if she fancied that's how she wanted the story to go, even if it made no sense. But there were certain character tropes where Lestat lost his eye to Memnock and he was like, oh, I, I will never take my eye back after that happened from a human. And then he became, he regressed to like Louis mentality and all that. And I'm like, was there a purpose to this? Or I mean, I, in, in the storyline, the way it flowed, it did yeah, flow naturally. Like, there's only so many evil vampires. Yes, exactly. Like, they're already, they're already, whenever you see through their POV, they're already like, I'm the most emotional. But then you're like, no, guys. And they all point to Louis, and they're like, actually, he is. Yeah, and uh, it's funny because Brad Pitt hated that role, for, particularly because of that aspect. That he, he's he like, did, why won't he do anything? Yeah, he's he like, bitch, do anything. you read the script. You're an actor. Do do what you're supposed to. The end. And I love um, that Ad Rice hated Tom Cruise for the role, and he did a great job, in my opinion. I think he did, he did a great job. We should end all of these sentences with allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, because we weren't there, to be honest. And this is like yeah, we weren't like, in the room with the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and Rice, she loved Tom Cruise afterwards with it, and she, she spoke did. his praise she about did. it. Yeah. Allegedly. Allegedly as well, yes. <laughs> should there be new movies? Like, I know they okay. got the TV rights, but should there be new movies? I think... Um, okay, so we're only talking about The Vampire Chronicles then. Oh, uh, no, we were going to touch on the Mayfair, which is, but I know very little about it, so I was going to give you your own segment for that. <laughs> okay, because I was going to uh, talk. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, we'll do it your way. Okay, um, um, but should there be new movies? Should there be new movies? Um, you know, I think that as long as they're not in English and no American studio does it and <laughs> they're all independent and so get the guy that did Parasite basically <laughs> no I mean because like I keep thinking about every good vampire movie that I've seen in the past like 15 years and they're all like German and they're all um, French and they're all dark and they're all moody and they all have these great camera angles and they all do these subtleties with special effects that, that are all just dealing with you know things out of the corner of your eye that make you really doubt your own sense of self yes. you know and and I think that that is the great thing about the books is because it's from the first person perspective, you have an untrustworthy narrative and that is never brought across in any of her movies. Yes. They're, they're seen from such a... The closest Hollywood... was Injury with the Vampire. The yes. Closest. Yes. And honestly, the reason why it was the closest was because of the last five minutes of the movie yes. <laughs> where Lestat shows up and he's like we're gonna do this my way and but the fact is is that the one part of the movie that really gives you the most feel of the books is the one part of the movie that was not in the books so I mean that just shows you that the the want to make the books big um, is what is gonna make the, the, the books being turned into movies fail so I think that unless we get a really not Hollywood eye yes. to look at it, um, it's going to fall flat. I feel Brian I Fuller could have did it really well, and it, it hurts me to know he dropped out. <laughs> um, well, after watching, I think, you know, I think that's an Hannibal. amazing, that's an amazing and evocative choice. Yeah, after watching Hannibal, you can definitely. I mean, come on, after watching Pushing Daisies, you're like, oh, I can see. I still have to watch Pushing died. Daisies. Uh, I have no well, reason to have about, not watched it by now. <laughs> uh, seriously, well, the great thing about Pushing Daisies is that um, every couple of episodes, it's like you're watching a different TV show, you know. And the what he did with so little was so uh, different. Um, God, you know what that reminds me um, is that um, Lee Pace, after he did Pushing Daisies, he did that um, that movie. Um, what was it? That one that also had the untrustworthy narrative. Um, where he was telling a story. Do you remember which one I'm no, talking about? No, I, I didn't. I, 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 I'm not privy to like knowledge about. Um, the fall. No, the fall. you watched it. The fall. I don't. Where remember. he is takes place in the 1920s, and um, he's in. He's an injured stuntsman who is in a hospital with a little girl who has a broken arm and he's telling her this story of a mythical hero and in her imagination as she's hearing the story it just is so surreal and beautiful and she just takes this and flies with it and the director Tarasim Singh it I would say he could do it I mean, because he's another one who just takes things and makes it so fluid and so, like, what 
he said to her, and he, you know, he also did the cell, the one. Oh, with, really? Uh, the one with Jennifer Lopez. Yeah. So you can imagine what he could do with it. Do you see what I mean? Another one was um, I I, I don't know if I, I I never saw the original. I saw the one with um that girl from um Kickass, um Let Me In. Yes. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Yes. So, I mean, that's the whole thing, is there There are so many directors out there that are, like, fringe directors. They are not big-ass names, but they are big names, and they have big-ass talent, you know? And and they can do a lot with, with surrealness yes. that is still literal. That is still, like, literal. Like, with The Fall, there were still moments where you're like, this is reality, this is a real thing. But, like... When you looked at vampire, uh, um, when you looked at um, interview with the vampire, mm. okay, and you think about the scenes that take place in, um, in 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 Louisiana, and you have to remember that the moment that Louis gets turned right mm. the world changes colors yes the wor- everything becomes vivid all the stuff becomes magical to him yes so like everything is supposed to be the same but different yes. so like the idea of keeping it the same 100% seems like a failure on the part of perspective yeah i it get, doesn't yeah, have I get to be that. and there are parts like legitimately where people are standing on ceilings and people are like flying around and doing ridiculous uh um oh yeah when they started flying later in the books that was i i can't even imagine how they're gonna handle that but that's what i'm saying you need a director that can take that and make that seem commonplace but also make it seem that sitting around at a dining room table being opulent is also commonplace yes and and the fact is is like if you get a, a a Hollywood director like Chris Columbus, like they stamp him on every fucking thing, you know. It's or the one that to, did um, um Or Kevin it, Branagh. Fucking Kenneth Branagh. Oh, oh my god, they get him for No, no, that'd be awful. Because he's <laughs> opulent. He's, yeah, he goes over the top. Boring, but I still but love he's him. Boring. But he's so boring. But th- that's the thing. It's like you can't just get a big name who makes things boring. You have to get a name. He didn't magical. do any justice to Thor. Like the original Thor, the first Thor movie was like, uh, it, it hurt to watch. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing that I say about Kenneth Branagh all the time. I love yeah. him very much, but not everything is Hamlet. Not yeah. everything is Hamlet. Yeah. He needs to give it a rest. But um. But yeah, so to answer to your question, which I think I've answered several times over, is that no, I really don't think that they need to be made into movies. Mm -hmm. However, I do feel like it being made into TV shows has more promise because as we've seen with Netflix, as we've seen with YouTube television shows, they're doing much more, they're pushing themselves much more to be dedicated to TV, to, to be dedicated to canon. Can you hold on one second? Yeah, sure. I'm on the phone! I don't have them. God, hold on one second. It's okay. But yeah, um, I'll talk in the meantime while she's away. Um... It's quite honestly uh, one of those uh, one of those stories that have stood with me since I was a kid. It's 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 changed my way of thinking. It's bloody housemates, man. Bloody housemates. It's okay. <laughs> no, I mean, okay. Uh, recently, very recently, as in two days ago, I encouraged my housemates to watch Impulse on YouTube, and the amount of effort and detail that they went into (laughs) to try and convert that book series into a television show compared to 
when they tried to convert that book series into a movie is freaking miles apart, worlds apart. And it just shows that what you can do with a TV series, the time, the focus, the concentration, the effort, the love, like, is just so much more. Okay. And I'm I do... Gonna... Uh, go on. No, go ahead. Uh, no, go I was going to say, um, uh, there's a three-part question, but it could all be at, summed up in one, at one question. I was going to ask, mm-hmm. what was the history that we loved from it? And um, uh, was Queen of the Dam? Uh, should this be? Should the new book be Queen of the Dam for the new generation? But I feel it could be all summed up in one question: If they were to inject themselves into the series, like right out the gate, who should they follow if not Lestat from the beginning? Um, that's a very confusing question. Well, I asked because last time, well, a couple of times they started it off from different perspectives and I guess that's the way Anne Rice does her thing sometimes she does start from different perspectives like she would have you jump into Armand's and Armand's book Pandora's and Pandora's book and then it would all lead back to Lestat in the end we joked about when we watched the originals how the the brothers and the uh, the lead brothers were basically Lestat yes yes and I feel that there's no problem with doing that again like we have seen that it works where you jump back and forth from one perspective to the other when we were in when we were in the perspective of Lestat he whined about wanting Louis around and whenever Louis was around he snapped Lestat back into being more his genuine self and to resolving his problems on his own. But then Lestat would whine about like, see, see, I function when you're around, don't leave me. And then we had like a third of the way through the story, through the, the lineage of, of the Vampire Chronicles, the story of Merrick, where we snap back into Louis's perspective. Mm-hmm. And it was the same thing where like, the idea of having Lestat back around to like, you know rattle him it's kind of what he needs to just keep him honest so I think the idea of kind of much like in the originals where it's like they both need each other to be honest to not yeah I mean to function I loved I loved the flow in the books of how like everything went back to Lestat at the ending of no matter whose book it was it would go back to Lestat or they would give you a peek into Lestat's world because that's all you really cared about and I think they should keep it the okay 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 that. okay that's all they really cared about I think I'm really <laughs> I think that that's all Anne Rice really cared yes. about but uh, that was not all I really cared about there yeah. were enough characters to care about um she had a like um she had so many characters. What was his name? David? Daniel? David, I think. David. Um, who? That him, was made by Armand. And that was the guy from the Talamasca from the Tales of the Body Thief's Body. It was very weird. <laughs> well, him, I had such such a fondness for it. Yeah, it was David. Yeah. David David Talbot. Yes. I had such a fucking affinity for him. Like and he was him? he was like supposed to be humanity's eye for such a yes. time period. Um and that's what kept him not uh not just because he was humanity's eye, but because he had that ability to like keep people in check I, I guess that's what it is I like characters who have the ability to walk among monsters and go eh, 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 keep your elbows off the table yeah like, I do like that too like um, there was uh, that character um, uh, let's see if I remember his name um, the one that was made by Akasha um, oh I'm drawing a blank and he was my favorite vampire Anyway, um, uh, I, I love the vampire that was one of the soldiers of Akasha, and I loved his perspective. He was, um, uh, he, he was, he was. I, I love that it was like 
when you first saw him, like Akasha was trying to blow up everybody, and she tried to do it to him, and they did it from a perspective like he didn't know who he was, and when she, he felt the burning ch chest pain when she tried to blow him up, she couldn't do it, and I think that like upped the ball, like it upped the game, like uh, like a hundred percent. I was like, I don't know who this guy is, but I love him. <laughs> like Akasha could have killed yeah, him. Yeah, <laughs> that's when they started like introducing the old one. Yes. And Akasha was so PO'd that she was like, "Oh man, I'm supposed to have dominion. What's with these bitches?" Yes, I I love them so much, and um. Can I'm... I just say? Yeah. Aaliyah's dancing as Akasha was the best fucking yes, thing in was. that movie. Yes, it was. I mean, I, I didn't agree 100% with a lot of things they did with that movie, but, but Aaliyah that knocked it out of the though. park. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, and to I think that, that was her one. first, her first, um, I think that was her first uh, opportunity in being in a major film. That's crazy. Uh, she was amazing. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Um, uh. Another question I want to ask, um, uh, do you think they should have taken should take liberties with this uh, with the franchise now, or do you think they should stick to like, hundred percent on ball with what they were doing, in the books? Um, n no, those books need editing, man. Okay, yeah, here's the thing do. about <laughs> here, here's the thing about okay, allegedly, <laughs> <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> Uh, I have some friends who work in the book industry, mm. um, and they are very well-known authors, and they have, uh, Do tell. okay, Queen of the Damned, Queen of the Damned was her second to last film. Mm. Uh, she was in a lot of shorts. R. Ke R. Kelly Summer Bunnies was like her first short. Ooh. She was in a lot, a lot of shorts, but Queen of the Damned was her only... F no, Romeo Must Die was her first film really? in 2000. Gotcha. Uh, I stand corrected. And, and that's not and an allegedly. <laughs> that is, this is not an allegedly. Yeah. And Queen of the Damned was her second film and I think her last film. Yeah, and everything else was uh, video shorts. Okay, so, okay. I not allegedly I in fact do have many friends who are in the book industry and in the publishing industry and what they have spoken of allegedly is that no they haven't allegedly spoken of this they have spoken of this and said that interview with the vampire was longer and more rambling and had to be edited down several times uh, and was a teeth pulling endeavor before it was published Ooh, that's harsh. and after it was published because it was such a rock star of an event and rice allegedly made some demands mm -hmm. and it was that she not have editors that wow. she be the only one that's harsh uh, and so she spoke openly about this event and uh, made some comments about not needing an editor because That's her very work... ill advised. <laughs> and she, uh, okay, this actually I heard in one interview where she was where she spoke about not needing editors, not having editors, but sometimes having people look at her work and giving her suggestions, which is in fact what an editor does. But she spoke very, very often about not having editors. With that and in people, mind. Oh, go on. And people in the book industry did tell her very often that she needed editors, allegedly. Yes. And she constantly refused. And her books didn't suffer for it selling wise but within the field of uh, books and selling and people with who she could work with it did suffer allegedly so with, with um, the, yeah. you gave me a three part question and I answered the first part and then oh no off. the three part question I put into one big question which is basically and that was a question you already answered 
No, you just asked me if I liked Armand. Oh, no, no, no. I, I asked you a bunch of questions already at this point. <laughs> okay, uh, continue. Um, uh, I think the last question I, I legitimately asked you was, um, what was it? Um, I don't remember. I, I, I'm doing things out of order because um, it helps for the flow of conversation. Um, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I remember. Should they take liberties with the book? I mean, with the books to series. That's what I said. I think, yeah. Well, yeah, it needs editing. Okay. I think they, I think, uh, like I said, with the film, the best part of it was when they decided to change it a bit. I think everything needs to be changed a bit. Was I think Anne it Rice... needs to be, the flow of TV is different than the flow of the book. The flow of film is different than the flow of the book. The yeah. flow of TV yeah. is different than the flow of film. I think with the flow of, of TV, you have, um, episodes that are 22 minutes you have episodes that are 42 minutes and you have to con keep that into consideration do you think Anne Rice was smart or greedy to hold out for AMC and do you think she should have went to someone else uh, I or are you just like I'm not at liberty to answer that question <laughs> If we're talking about my personal opinion, I think AMC is a bad fit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, but, on top of that, they're talking about but, putting it on Shutter through AMC. See, I think these are all. <laughs> I think these are all. This is a hot mess. Yeah, I agree. But um, but I will say that um, AMC does incredible things. Yeah, they have in the past. They done quite a couple of things. They can be remarkable. They can knock things out of the park, but there is no guarantee because they have done really sticky things. Yeah, you know, and it just seems to be a swinging pendulum with them. Yeah, to be either really sticky or really remarkable. Yeah. Um, so last... I I think that if she were going to hold out for something, that she would have held out for a streaming service. Yeah. Uh, well, she's she's. They said she's going to be streaming on AMC's Shutter um, app, which I feel like is needless. They should have just put it on Hulu with other AMC stuff. But whatever. Um, I don't know. It's just another app to add to the millions of app. But that's a personal problem. Some people don't care about that. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, last two questions, and then we'll go to the Mayfair Witches, which is all you. Uh, that's all you, because I don't know much about the Mayfair Witches. <laughs> but um, um, how powerful do you think the score, or do you think they should have uh, um, a custom-made score? M music -wise? Yeah, um, should, should they go all out with that? I think, honestly, that's a as my, my opinion or what's most likely most likely most likely uh, I think most likely they're just gonna have music added into it that seems to be an AMC yeah. thing and, um, um, I think that there's a good I mean as somebody who is as somebody who hears a good song on a TV show and puts the TV show on pause and immediately downloads that song there is good opportunity in getting good music for your show. Yes. I think I think there is also, you know, a chance of really doing great mute music for a piece and creating your own score, but that is less likely for a companion piece for your film. I brought up the score your... because um I was watching Interview with the Vampire before I called you. And that had an amazing score. Like, that score was out of the park. That's true, but how many people remember the score compared to remembering Sympathy for the Devil? That's true. You didn't get a point. <laughs> um, last question for the, for the Vampire stuff, um, or the Vampire Chronicles. Um, what games do you think were inspired by Anne Rice's Chronicles, and which ones do you think have failed completely in bringing out what could be a good Vampire series I mean everything about Alucard reminds me about Vampire yes. Chronicles I mean um yeah pretty much <laughs> I mean Legacy of Cain was great that, that a great storyline but it's so dated it 
it's unbelievable how dated it is. Yeah, but so is Vampire Chronicles. Yeah. Like I said, their best days their best days really are behind them. I'm sorry. Once the Vampire Chronicles started like sliding into Oh god, I'm sorry. Um once we started sliding into like Tales of the Body Thief and Mother yeah. of the Devil, <laughs> I started I started slipping away. Same then here. they had then they had wonderful things like Memnoth the, uh, the, um, Mem- the Devil was I. You had Vampire Armand, which was cool. Mm. Then you had Merrick, which was basically a fanfic. Vittorio! I, I loved it. Vittorio, but Vittorio wasn't a Vampire Chronicles. Vittorio I know, was, which is so weird that it's included in the list. <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. No, if you look at her website, it's uh, separate. It's on a list that's called New Tales of Vampires. No, no, no. It's I mean, not... that's included in what AMC acquired. Oh, well, that's just because they want... Everything and rice. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, I mean... Have you seen the Vampire Masquerade uh, trailer? Here, the here's the one? thing. Here's the oh, thing. God. What I love about, like, her series is that they are all, like... Uh, aware of each other because even in Ramsey's The Dam they were like oh we hear about somewhere in New Orleans there's supernatural stuff going on so um, we're gonna avoid that yeah, like they, they're, 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 like they're, her... they kind of talk about it but they're like yeah fuck that shit she did fuck have these shit. overarching themes that you're like I wonder what if these connect and she did nothing with them a la Stephen King style except Stephen King directly addresses it later on but Anne Rice never addresses it. <laughs> but she wanted to make sure to like let you know. Yeah, yeah. That much. they're in the same universe. Supernatural things happen in the same universe, but like they don't have to. Like she wanted to make it seem like around the world us uh, around 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 us in this world there is magic, which I can appreciate. Well, you know, that leads to every, the next direction. W- well, every writer wants to make us feel like around us there is magic and therefore a part of us can be magical, which I think is very kind as mm-hmm. far as writers go. But she had such a hard on for Lestat that it just made she it... She did. She did. It just made it obnoxious. It didn't make it endearing. Yeah. I mean, I, I liked the vampire Lestat as a book, but when you think of the overarching themes that she had going on for the series, yeah, but it kind of lost the its Prince way. Lestat? No, how was Prince Lestat? Did... I didn't read it because oh, it was read... it was so long. Then there's the the Speaking latest of the one. Devil, he's on the screen. latest <laughs> one. The latest one, uh, which is in 2016, is the Prince Lestat and the Realms of Atlantis. Ooh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I mean, you see what I mean? It's just yeah. she slowly, slowly became even more and more ridiculous. I think she loves history, and that's one of the things I loved about her, that she would work really hard to make history as accurate as she can, uh, uh, like an Assassin's Creed version of in books. And she would put her va- inject her vampires into it, and it was very interesting, but ultimately led up to what in the beginning? I mean, in the end, I have no idea. See, I appreciated Anne Rice as a whole. It, so for me, it wasn't like I'm a Vampire Chronicles fan. Like, I knew that there was a place in my heart for Interview, and there always would be. It was one of those books that I could pick up, and I could just open to random pages, and I could read from there, and I could just be swallowed up for a big chunk. Yeah. And I knew that Queen of the Damned would always have, like, such a place. But then I knew that immediately... I would switch over to Ramsey's or the Mayfair Witches. I would just like switch back and forth. I knew that I could go to like Belinda or Feast of All Saints and Mm -hmm. I would be happy with those and I would never have to continue reading the Vampire Chronicles. I knew that because it was for me it was just being swallowed by these characters who had these ways about them. It wasn't really, it didn't really have to do with the all over adventure. It had to do with the people. Well, we got so, 10 minutes left to make this an hour. So tell me about the Mayfair Witches <laughs> and why um, that's a big deal well, in this universe. 
why is it a big deal in this universe? I don't think that it is. <laughs> really? I heard so many good things I about don't... Lasher. So many good things. Um, I don't think that it is because in my personal opinion, Taltos, which is the last of the three books, was uh, such a letdown. Yeah. Uh, for me, in my opinion. The is she Witch still going with those books? Was... No, it was a it was a trilogy. Gotcha. Um, Merrick is a Mayfair witch, and she crosses over into the Vampire Chronicles. Yeah, so did David this with is... um, the Talamasca and stuff. Oh yeah, I thought the Talamasca stretching into both series was fucking fabulous because I thought that um, having an investigator investigating the witches brought a level of like. Uh, 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 of uh, realism or of, dr of drama of like intensity of of peril that it brought a level of yeah. peril because this is a family that lived in secrets and in obscurity in the way you did in New Orleans yeah you know in the way that you have these this you live in uh you hold your family's secrets and they live from generation to generation, yeah. but only within your family. And then you have the Talamasca sneaking around and poking at it, and you're just like, nah, if you poke at me, you poke at hundreds of me's. Yes. My grandfather, my great-grandfathers, my aunts and my uncles. Like, so don't poke at me. Is and so true? having the Talamasca poke around was like, it was. there was a great sense of peril. And so you already, if you read the Vampire Chronicles, you already got a sense, a sense of like, What's what Nothing. lies in the Don't. distance? Yeah. So well, you already got a sense of like these guys are trouble, and in the witching hour, if you you don't have to have that explained to you, but if you start the witching hour from there, you start it as like he's a singular guy from a faceless organization. So you all you don't have to have it explained to you, yeah. but if you do have it explained to you you're like ooh there's trouble brewing yeah, it's gonna yeah. be big so, I think um, um, one, of, one of the themes that I yeah. like that she oh she did sorry to cut you off um, one of the things that I like that she did was there was this one story where because um, they didn't play with um, the afterlife for a long time and it, uh, when they finally did like um I like the way they led led to there, where Lestat was like, I think he was sleeping or something uh, in the ground, and he came out and he saw like a twig come to life, and the twig was playing with him and messing with him, and he said at first he thought that it was like some trickery, then it was deeply concerning him and scaring him, as a as mm -hmm. as a person as a vampire, and he was like, I don't like what's going on here. <laughs> How, how did you get to talking about vampires again? I Sorry, we no, no, because the, the spirit realm, the spirit realm, the spirit realm. Well, okay, that brings us back to Lasher. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing about the end of the witching hour is that this great supernatural event happens. And in Lasher, it's just very straightforward of like, okay, it's a demon. That's ah, the end. It's a demon. Okay. Well, you know? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's like the great, the great many generations and the great secrets of all the things in the witching hour and all the witches, in our blood and in our like generational, like you know the things we keep secret is that all together we add up and are like it's a uh, what is it? It's a it's like a pact or whatever that uh, it adds up to like if this person connects to that person and eventually this generation may let loose a demon and then the demon's here and he's like hey I'm a hot guy and I'm like alright this is less interesting <laughs> and of course it's Anne Rice so of course she'd go that way yeah and and so and then in Taltos it's just it's just for me it's less satisfying so but the witching hour is great because you have this remarkable uh, it's I, I guess you could say for me it's very similar to um, Queen of the Damned in that respect is that you meet these Multiple people you meet yeah you meet you meet the generations you cool. meet them either being celebrated or persecuted you meet the one witch in all the generations who's a man but he's respected as a witch because I believe he was a gay man um, um, 
you know, um, I think Deirdre was the witch that was persecuted. I'm not sure, but I remember her story being like a, a bit long suffering and sad. Um, yeah, she has a way with those sad stories that twist your, a knife into your heart. <laughs> yeah, and all of these, all of these things are being told from the perspective of while while you're listening to the story that's like happening present tense which is a girl who's like an orphan who is connected to this family i say girl she's a woman um and and i remember much like M M Anne rice does is like there was a sex scene that had a blowjob in it and i was like i was bad at very young age when i read this so oh, i was boy. like no oh, i'm gonna take i was like i'm gonna take notes this seems <laughs> relevant to my interest <laughs> oh boy but yeah um so so yeah i think the, out of all of them the witching hour was the best but like much in my in, in the way that i thought um queen of the damned was the best because i loved hearing the story of all of these people and lasher narrowed it down to just the story of the perspective of of the lead character and still you had like some crossover and some different people interest but i, I it just started like it just it just started it was still an adventure it was a great adventure but I, my interest started to wane and as a three book arc it was great it was solid but it just I I just really didn't care about Lasher who's somebody you're supposed to care about and you're supposed to find interesting and evocative and I, I just mean, kind of wanted him to be gone. Uh, we have a little bit of time left, like four minutes. Um, I have one last question, and it's a little bit of a fanboy, fangirl question. Fan casting um, for one character in particular that you would like. Who would you fan cast as uh, 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 for one person in particular? Um, it could be Anne Rice, uh, vampire, or Mayfair witches. Um, Would you like um, my answer while you think? <laughs> can I have Ezra Miller as everybody? <laughs> Ezra Miller. Oh man. Um, uh, speaking of Ezra Miller and stuff like that, uh, the new, the those new brooding actors. I want what's his name? <laughs> um, um, the guy that's gonna be in the new Dune. I forgot his name. That's playing uh, the, the young Atreides. I want him to be Lestat. <laughs> he has the bone structure. Uh, I forgot his Chalamet? name. Chalamet. Timothy Chalamet. Yeah. Chalamet. 